Going to call to order our first committee meeting of the night. It is Monday, February the 7th, um, 6.03 p.m. We have public safety up first. Um, myself, Carol King, and both members of the committee, Mr. Allgood and Mr. Kraling, are both present, as well as uh, Mr. Madden. Chief Miller is in chambers, and I guess Chief McCone is. Chief Gerald. Chief McCone is not here this evening. Um, he's out of town. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And um, Judge Martin online? He is. Chief All right. Is. So that brings us to the um, next agenda item, which is public comment. We have two public comments for the evening. If anyone would like to speak, no one online. All right. Then we'll move on to reading and approval of the minutes from January the 4th. I'd like to move to approve the minutes as written from January the 4th. Thank you, Mr. Kralin. Have a motion to have a second? Second. Any discussion or corrections? Hearing none, all those in favor of um, approving the minutes from January the 4th, say aye. 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 None opposed. Motion carries. We now come to the portion for the reports from our city officers. Um, Mr. Madden, do you have anything for Chief McCone? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so Chief McCone and his some of his uh, senior staff members are in Wisconsin reviewing the uh, new trucks, fire apparatuses that they've purchased, city has purchased. Uh, pictures of those uh, apparatuses were placed in the administrator's report for last week. Um, so he's not here, but we talked about his budget during our weekly meeting last week. Uh, he's exactly where he should be about this time, a uh, little, little over 40% of his budget remaining uh, as we uh, kind of swiftly go through the remainder of this fiscal year. Perfect. Um, any questions concerning fire from committee? All right, seeing none, we will move to Judge Martin. And Judge Martin is online. Yes, good evening. Hey, Judge Martin, how are you? Good, how are you all? Great, great. Good. Um, just two things to report, please. Um, first of all, we are 7% under our budget, and we are still under court order in reference to the mask and the um, limited number of people that can be in the courtroom. Um, if that changes, um, I will let you all know. Great, thank you. Um, any questions for Judge Martin, um, committee? All right, seeing none, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Chief Miller, looks like you have a budget review and then a update for us. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, the ideal remaining percent uh, should be 43%, and we're sitting at 49% right now. Uh, also, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a meeting in the courtroom and also on Zoom for the Forester Creek uh, subdivision in reference to the speed humps. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out last week for the uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation for uh, Bennett. Uh, everybody participated. Uh, it, it was, I mean, it was, it, let me see, what was it, California? There's a newspaper in California picked up the, the uh, story there. Uh, we just got four admin cars, which are just plain uh, explorers. They, they're not the police package. We just got those in. Uh, they're in service. We're going Friday. We're going to pick up one more, the last admin car. We're going to pick up a supervisor's car and four patrol cars in Saluda, and we'll bring them back to Unique and get those outfitted. Uh, the remaining eight, they've been built. They just don't have chips for them right now. So hopefully we'll get those going pretty soon. Uh, also, it was in the administrator's report. We had cops with kids, the fist bump Friday at Bethel Elementary. Uh, we had about 10 officers out there in two different locations meeting the kids as they came in. Uh, this month, we also received $1,071 from the DEU, the Drug Enforcement Unit. And also today we received a check for $1,000 from the uh, Enforcement Underage Drinking Laws, the EDL. They, uh, they give us $1,000 every year to keep that program running. And 
that is all I've got. Great. And I'll echo on the make a wish was I, I, I'm just speechless as to how wonderful and amazing that event was. So many um, different organizations came together to, to make it happen. So for those that you, of y'all that could not make it, I encourage you to look at the photos and um, online on Facebook, the various postings, because it was um, very heartwarming to say the least. I have to forward you the video. His mom sent us a thing. You could, yeah, yeah, I've got it. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes, sent yes. a video of him thanking everybody. He's a little winker. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I think that's, uh, they said it was a nervous tick. When he gets nervous, he starts winking. That's so sweet. So, uh, that's, he's, a, he's a really good kid. Right. Maybe um, he'll let you borrow his car if we if we need an extra. We can do that. We, <laughs> got it. Not sure anybody would fit in it, but. <laughs> yeah, no, not anybody in this police department. So, so Bennett <laughs> so. was given a motor, uh, a battery operated little car that um, Chief Miller and his folks put the official Malden police logo on that little car. And it, it was just, it's just amazing. Everything that he had a key to the city presented to him by the mayor. So, um, and he called the robber. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was a good day. He was, he was initially supposed to ride where the robber was. They had the car in there. He was sp initially supposed to ride in there, but it was, it was just so cold. Then we drove through the neighborhood. We had about 30 patrol cars going through there, and all the neighbors were standing out by the road. And there was Banners and signs, yep. Up and giving him little bags of presents and stuff. And they, somebody even gave him some donuts. And <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but that's all I got to report tonight. I appreciate Great. it. Great. Thank you, Chief. All right. Um, that takes us to unfinished business, which we have none tonight. So moving on to new business, um, the first agenda item is the guaranteed maximum price amendment for the fire station, which you can find on pages 6 through 10. And I think we have a presentation, or Mr. Madden, you want to take the lead on that? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, we have um, the city's architect for the new fire station and police substation, Mr. Ken Newell of Stuart Cooper Newell, and the... Uh, construction manager for the project from Cloverleaf Construction, uh, Mr. Drew Wren. Um, so Mr. Newell, if you could uh, come up to the to podium, he's going to present information on the guaranteed maximum price. Now, just, uh, just for some background information, council has already approved uh, the work for this project. This is the actual price amendment of how much the project is anticipated to cost and not to exceed with the, the guaranteed maximum price. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me, and thank you for allowing us to be part of this project. We always enjoy working for the town and the city of Malden, so we were fortunate enough to do Station 3 a few years ago, so I spent a lot of time around here at that time doing that. So, But we do appreciate it. I, I really, my part of tonight's presentation is just to remind you and show you a couple of images of what the station is intended to be and to look like. Uh, the image that you see in front of you is how this building actually sits on the site. Uh, we spent a good bit of time, as you probably have already heard, programming what the needs of the facility were, including fire and police together. Uh, we went through multiple rounds of that to try to get it down to its absolute uh, most efficient floor plan, get the size down so that the budget can stay under control as much as possible. As you know, it's very challenging times with budgets and supply chain issues that are taking place right now. Uh, but this is the resulting station. We feel really good about it, proud of it. It's a uh, multi-bay drive-through system. As you can see, it, it faces there onto uh, Butler and then the side street. So on the darkest return driveway to the rear is how the apparatus would return, drive all the way around the building through the bays. There is a bypass lane on the left-hand side uh, for uh, extra parking for other visiting apparatus or school buses for tours or just to be able to get around the station when you need to get around it for the emergency vehicles. Only, as you'll notice, the only thing that mixes with those driveways and parkings on that side of the site is the emergency apparatus. Uh, it's a safety issue to try to keep the public separated. And the parking lot to the far right is the public parking lot with some scattered rear parking lot in the back for the staff as well. Uh, so it's a fairly simple layout. It works on the site well. The big uh, space that you see at the far back of the site, the upper part of the plan, is the detention pond for stormwater detention. Uh, so it's a pretty sizable pond that's necessary for that, but it works out well for us as far as collecting everything that's necessary for this site. The next images that you will see are really just a couple of the renderings of the facility. Uh, we think that it's going to be a very attractive facility for the city. It's, it's good, durable bricks. Our intent 
And our goal, we and by the way, you wouldn't know this, but we've completed over 450 fire stations in our firm's history. So our goal on fire stations is to make them as maintenance-free and durable as possible. So the intent of this building is that for it to be a 50 to 75-year building uh, and to be easier to maintain than many other buildings that you've had to uh, deal with in the past. So uh, brick is the exterior materials, a couple of different colors of brick. Uh, TPO roof on some of the lower sloped roofs and the higher sloped roofs would be metal standing seam roofs. So uh, it's going to be an attractive facility, we feel like, for the fire department and be one that will serve the uh, police and fire department very well. So uh, with that being said, I will be glad to answer any design questions you may have, but I know that you're really interested in hearing from Mr. Drew Wren today about the money. So. <laughs> It's okay, Brandon. I don't know if we're excited about that or not, but. <laughs> Anything else? No, thank, thank you, Mr. Newell. Um, I'm, good evening. Good evening. Um, Drew Wren um, from Cloverleaf Construction. Um, we've been working with the uh, architect uh, for a while now to develop this GMP. Um, as Ken said, it is tough times right now, and the past uh, two months, we've been very diligent in diving into cost savings, uh, working with different materials to uh, get the best look, but, you know, at a reasonable price. Um, so that being said, um, the we'll present a GMP and kind of break down what that is made of and if y'all have any questions we'll, we'll go from there um, right now uh, the GMP is slated at seven million four four hundred ninety seven thousand one thirty eight uh, we break that down as you see on the screen um, the stormwater cost for the project as designed um, is approximately two hundred forty one thousand um, dollars this is consistent of all the pipes, uh, the grading for the storm water system, um, anything that collects water into the pond and gets it off the site. This is the number that is included in that. Um, we moved to HVAC cost. Um, we've got 331,000. This is the total system to heat uh, and cool the, uh, the station. Um, the remainder of the cost, um, Pretty much anything from the ground up to the roof is coming in at six million seven hundred forty-three thousand nine hundred seventy. Uh, the remainder of the balance is uh, owner's contingency at one one hundred and eighty-one thousand. Eighty-one thousand of that is um, classified for any rock or, or unsuitables, which this property does have rock. Our geotech as indicated, there is rock in certain areas and we've, we've played with the, um, the civil and the building layout to move it away from the rock to save money on them um, best we can, but it is, it is some shallow rock on the site. So um, hopefully we can deal with it in, you know, a, a trenchable way that's less cost at this time. Um, again, we, we've, we're working with select subcontractors right now to develop uh, DE options um, to lower this number. But as of right now, it's a pretty aggressive number. And as Ken can um, share with this, out of six projects, we're coming in probably on the lower end of square footage from a cost standpoint. Um, so we feel like our company is pretty aggressive and we're just being mindful of the city's money. So. So real quick, um, this may need to go back to the to the design concept, but th we went back and forth about the three bays and the additional costs. So, so does this cost include the total for the three bays? It does. Struck it out completely? Okay. Thank you. See, that was easy. <laughs> now for these gentlemen. <laughs> These are all good? You have any questions? I have a question that I don't know who answers. Um, with this property being built and with that, for example, the stormwater requirements for this particular property, would there be any, as where the site currently would be, would there be any potential development on either side of this property? 
Uh, Mr. Allgood, right now on one side of the property, there's an existing development, uh, Glen Eagle Apartments. And on the other side of the property, there's an, there's already a development, I believe, uh, public storage. Self-storage. Self yes. mm -hmm. uh, and some commercial up front on that side. Um, you know, in talking with uh, Drew and, and SCN about the layout, one, one, as Drew mentioned, one of the challenges is rock there. Uh, but some of the requirements from Greenville County who permits the stormwater for the site um, is, is contributing to this because there has to be a, and Drew, you can elaborate more, a concrete wall there um, in addition to a berm around the detention pond. Yeah, so we're, we're still trying to work with the civil engineer currently to, to finalize that design. We're, we've shifted the building up and over to possibly make a bigger pond to eliminate some co concrete walls, which are very expensive. So uh, we're looking at every possible uh, scenario to to get out of the rock and um, get away from concrete retaining walls. Thank you. My, that was the, the gist of my question is whenever we were talking about building retention ponds and everything else, I wanna make sure that either the existing properties that are there or if they're not there and there's, there's, there's new development going on that we take that into account. So thank you for that. And my, th this may be for Mr. Madden. My only final question is if you guys would be available for our council meeting this month, have you gotten that far, Mr. Madden? Uh, yes, we've uh, discussed the schedule for if, if, if the committee forces the full council um, and uh, either in person or in Zoom, they'll be available. Just since there's four other members, if yes, yeah, once we forward this to full council, I would like for you guys to be available if they were to have any questions as well. Absolutely. Um, but I would not be the expert to answer. <laughs> Thank y'all for coming out tonight. Very, very good presentation and gave us the information we needed to move forward, I think. All right, so what would be committee's pleasure at this point in time um, in reference to the guaranteed maximum price? <clears throat> this time I'd like to make a motion that uh, we move the full council uh, for potential <clears throat> approval of the guaranteed maximum price uh, for the construction of the new fire station. Thank you, Mr. Kralin. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Mr. Allgood, any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of forwarding to full council say aye. 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 None opposed, motion carries unanimously. All right, that gets us back around to our second public comment. Hello, Ms. Jolan, welcome tonight. <laughs> um, seeing none online, Mr. Madden? No, Madam Chair. All right, committee concerns. Hearing none, then that leads us to adjournment. What do I have on adjournment? Moved. Motion to have a second? Second. Second. We stand adjourned. 622. Thank you all. All right, we're going to go ahead and call tonight's Economic Development Committee meeting to order at 624 p.m. February 7th. Uh, all committee members are present, as is the city administrator. We have a first public comment period of the evening. Does anybody have the, uh, anything that they want to provide tonight? All right, what do I hear on reading and approval of minutes? I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of January 4, 2022. Um, approval. We have a motion, is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. And that moves to reports and communications from city officers. I'm gonna go ahead and provide that tonight for Mr. Broad. The ideal remaining percentage is 39% but we are sitting uh, at 46% right now. So everything is uh, looking great financially with the department. Uh, one thing that I, I do wanna bring to your attention in the packet that you received, um, noting the Cultural Center Gala uh, for a number of factors, including construction and COVID, the, uh, the gala has been postponed until April. So I know that it says in your packet, February, 20, whatever, February 28th. 
24th. Or 24th, um, but it's going to be in April, and Van will provide additional information uh, about that rescheduling. April 21st. Thank you, Ms. King. And I have uh, Van's information for each of the committee members, if you would like it. Ms. Kuzner, I'll give it to you in a, in a minute. I, either that or I can fold it up into a paper airplane and fly it over to you. <laughs> if you're good at that, that works for me. <laughs> uh, Drew Parker with the Parker Group could not be here this evening. So uh, Mr. Madden is going to read his report. Madden. Thank you, Councilor. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, so the, the Parker Group is uh, excited to close on the city center property, which is the Jenkins Street property by February 28th. Um, assuming, assuming that they've had the opportunity to review and provide input on the engineered road plans from Co-Transco. Um, shortly after the closing occurs, uh, they want to begin the environmental abatement. Once the, 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 the abatement should, should take about a couple of weeks, then they'll proceed to demolition of the buildings, except the former Healy Brown building, which will be the, the new site of the pickle yard. Um, and for Maverick Station, they're hoping to wrap up this spring. Sully Steamers is expected to open in May, and Bohemian Bull is expected to open uh, during the summer. That concludes uh, the report from the Parker Group. All right, thank you, Mr. Madden. Uh, I don't know that he can answer any additional questions because that's the information that he has, but you're certainly welcome to ask if you have them. Mr. Crayling. Real quick, the uh, Cultural Center being still on target uh, as far as schedule, work being done? Uh, there there have been some, some delays um, um, there, which is why they're delaying the, uh, the gala. Um, but outside of that, uh, the Dario construction is pushing as fast as possible to get the, the project completed. All right, and next up, Mr. Madden, do you wanna go ahead and introduce our friends from Crawford? Yes, we have Crawford Strategies here. As you may recall, they are working uh, on a communication plan for the city, given the number of projects ongoing. And so I'll, I'll, I'll have their presentation up here uh, and I'll let them present to the committee. Th there should be a um, clicker. Okay, great. Um, good evening. Um, I'm Emily Mosley with Crawford and Nikoi Crawford is joining us today. Um, I think we've met some of you before. Um, for those of you who haven't, nice to meet you. Um, thank you so much for working, for partnering with us and choosing us to work with you on this. Uh, we've had an a really good time working with Brandon and the team um, on the steps thus far. So what we're here to do tonight is kind of show with you some findings from the first two phases of this process. Um, there were two documents that we provided in advance that have more in them. So if there's more detail that you're looking for, some of that may be in those other presentations. Tonight, I've tried to summarize that for speed um, and time um, and try to highlight some key things so that we don't have to get Okay, so just to recap, um, for this project, we engaged in what we call discovery. Um, and this consisted of first a tour with uh, David and Brandon uh, throughout Malden, focusing specifically on projects in areas of new development. Um, so we did that in August of 2021. Then we followed up that with a discovery meeting in September 2021 uh, with various kind of key stakeholders identified by the city to really understand some key features of the city including target audiences, um, what we want to try to communicate, areas of strength, areas of weakness, things like that, and then current barriers. From there, we expanded our discovery process to 11 stakeholder interviews, also identified by the city, where we talked for about 30 minutes, um, understanding their perceptions of development in Malden, their perceptions of what others might think about what's going on, um, and then also any thoughts on how to influence others or kind of reach others in the community regarding Malden development. And then finally, we did a community survey, um, and that was launched in early November, November 8th. Uh, the data that we'll present tonight is through January 7th, 2022. This was made 
uh, available to the entire um, population of Malden through a variety of ways. We put it on the city social media channels. We send it out to media. Uh, and then we also included an insert in sewer bills, trying to reach those who might not be on social media. Um, and we ended up receiving 777 total responses as of January 7th, which we were really pleased about. So um, we felt like that was a great so jumping right in. So the discovery session, as I mentioned, these findings are kind of summarized from everything except the community survey. So we see strengths of the community as the friendly people and the community pride that people have for Malden. The convenient location uh, geographically and uh, both in the upstate and kind of in the state. Affordability for both residents and businesses and uh, a variety of recreational opportunities. Uh, the weaknesses we discussed during those meetings was a lack of a central downtown, uh, inconsistent communication or perce perception of inconsistent communication at least, um, aesthetic appearance, and potentially a lack of variety in dining options depending on who you're asking. Uh, we also hope uh, we see some opportunities. Um, and so that is fostering inclusion across different resident demographics, especially as the community evolves. Balancing the growth that is ex being experienced with the local feel that people love and um, continued engagement through the cultural center opportunities that are already there. Some threats that we see are potential outside developer delays, which um, you have already you know, somewhat encountered in, in various things um, and could in the future. Um, running out of property, just simply running out of space, um, potentially false information and rumors, and then frustration with uh, with traffic that may come as a result of increased development or increased population growth and potentially a loss of green space. We also identified these as our key audiences uh, for this particular project in particular, current residents and current business owners, your potential residents, your potential business owners, the media as also a conduit for reaching some of those folks, and then your own city employees because they can act as ambassadors for your brand and for the city um, in addition to being employees. So as we're looking at to how to communicate better um, or where, where are some increased opportunities to communicate, we wanna understand where people are getting their information now. So uh, word of mouth popped up a lot, um, primarily via school groups and schools, uh, churches, through your neighborhoods, and always um, the barbershops and beauty salons. Um, the media was still very highly mentioned. Um, local TV and print news outlets usually popping up at the top, although radio also, um, you'll see in the community survey, radio does pop up in there too. And then um, city channels are, people mentioned those frequently when we spoke with the stakeholders, uh, the 11 interviews. Um, we did hear from them quite a bit that the newsletter and city channels and social media, they, they were receiving information from those areas. Um, and the website also popped up um, later on in the survey as a trusted resource. So they are paying attention to what the city is saying. So that's, that's good. <laughs> we are glad to see that. From our stakeholder interviews, we created this word cloud of just some of the words that we heard mentioned quite a bit. Um, so I think you see a balance here of things that you'll see, or you continue to see this balanced theme throughout the findings. Um, obviously growth is on everyone's mind. They can see it in many ways, um, but they also community and family um, is still a huge part of, the, um, of what they think about Malden. Um, I think in addition to that, you see also in larger print, the traffic and the infrastructure. So kind of, again, that balance of the growth, um, the benefits of the community, just with that balanced growth. Um, I love some of the other words that you see here, opportunity, sense of belonging, um, affordable, heart. Um, there's some great, great words in here for what those uh, stakeholders thought about Malden. So we asked them uh, about eight to 10 questions and their detailed answers in the full report, but we highlighted a few here um, for just additional consideration. Um, so first we wanted to hear from these 11 folks, what have you heard or what do you know about plans for the future development in Walden? Um, and just a reminder that these were conducted in November. So uh, most, all of the results you'll see tonight were prior to the announcement about the soccer, potential soccer stadium at Bridgeway Station. So that will not pop up in this, these, any of these results. Um, so Bridgeway Station was mentioned quite a bit, um, extension of Swamp Rabbit Trail, 
Um, we did see uh, some mention of City Center and uh, Main Street and Butler and Maverick Station. So those two, I think, are definitely high, high top of mind, especially amongst this group who tended to be a little bit more engaged. Most of these folks, um, I would say a good number of these folks had some sort of stake either as a business owner or a member of the community um, that was a little higher, uh, more awareness of what's going on. Um, so that's that. But then when you go to the next question, um, which we're highlighting here, do you feel like you heard, you hear enough and do you wish you heard more? And pretty much across the board, um, they all wish they could, they could hear more. Um, and I, I think even for those who, you know, like I said, some, a lot of these people are um, on the more engaged side. So they're, um, they're already hearing some, uh, but they'd like to hear more. So when you think about the folks who may not be as engaged, um, they probably don't feel like they hear enough because they're not seeking it out themselves. Um, and, and we also asked some questions and you'll see in the further report about um, how they feel about neighbors and friends who aren't as engaged in what they, in what they think. So um, I think there's definitely opportunity for starting here, we start to see um, opportunity for more proactive and consistent communication um, that would be received very well amongst, um, amongst your audiences. And then this is kind of a good forward looking question about um, what's your hope for the future of the Malden community in five, 10 or 15 years. Um, and there was a lot of positivity and optimism um, about what's coming and, and just maintaining the identity through the growth. Um, and, but understanding that with growth comes some change. So uh, some really interesting uh, nuggets here and I hope that y'all um, will have you know, 15 minutes or so to read through all the rest of the questions because I thought it was really interesting. I think this is the end of our portion on the um, kind of the discovery, which were those kind of key stakeholder interviews. And I will take a breath and ask if y'all have any questions before I keep going. Any questions before we proceed? Catch your breath. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I am not from Malden or South Carolina, so I'm sorry if I talk too fast. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, survey was super interesting and really excited to bring um, bring these results to you. Um, and like I said, the longer uh, PowerPoint has more detail in there. But first off, um, this is a picture of where everyone lives who responded to the survey. So um, you can see within the zip codes, like what the responses we got. Um, so primarily over 50% in that 662 zip code. And just to stop you for one quick second, but as a reminder to anybody who doesn't know, there are five zip codes in Malden. So when you see the 607 and 605 of Greenville or the 80 and 81 of Simpsonville, those are actually within Malden city limits. Yeah. Just clarify. Thank you. Okay. So there were a lot of demographics, um, but we're trying to highlight some of them here and they're very small. Or I can go back on the screen a little better. Okay, so we did see that, um, I think we had over 60% of females, uh, or 60% of respondents identified as female. Um, so there, but that is fairly common for these types of surveys. It's not unexpected. 45% uh, of our respondents were Gen X or older millennials. So um, which means the ages of 36 and 55. Again, fairly, um, normal to or fairly expected to get that kind of uh, response from the age. 90% um, of respondents categorized themselves as white. Respondents were also highly educated with over 60% having at least a bachelor's degree. Um, and we saw a very high percentage of master's degrees here um, as well, which correlated with the bucket on the far right that a third of respondents represented a high income household earning more than 125,000 per year. Um, so just some really interesting things there. Obviously, again, for people to take the time to click on the survey, take the time to fill it out. Again, you're probably seeing an audience that's more highly engaged in this topic and interested in it. Um, but we were, we thought those were pretty interesting statistics as far as the responses. Um, two thirds of respondents also report having no children living at home. So it doesn't mean that they're not empty nesters. It just means they're not currently responsible for children um, at, in their home. So again, kind of interesting as well. And then 40% um, of survey respondents said that they work in Greenville with another 29% responding that they worked in Malden. So I don't, don't know how often y'all get this kind of, that kind of data amongst your residents. So, but we thought that was pretty interesting. Okay, 
So now starting to dig into a little bit of more of the meat. Um, so we asked for their preferences um, for where they receive their local news. And this is broken down by age and it's there's some tiny percentages there, but the colors, um, the red represents ages between 56 and 75, the lighter green represents between 36 and 55, and the darker teal represents between 18 and 35. So um, local television news, um, kind of what we'd expect, we see about, um, you know, much more highly watched by the older uh, residents. And then it's the reverse for the social media from Facebook, um, where you see your younger demographic receiving a lot more of their news from Facebook. Um, and then Greenville News was kind of a balance between all three demographics. Uh, Gville Today, the email newsletter, again, more highly read as a younger age. So nothing really surprising on here, um, but just kind of a good validation that to reach all demographics, you really need to think about all the various platforms. Um, and then uh, also of note that um, Instagram is definitely highly watched by your younger audiences. Um, and then in the full other presentation, there's a lot more detail on what that other includes. Um, and that's, that is um, some good inspiration and thoughts for our forthcoming communication plan on just some other ideas outside of the traditional outlets that we're talking about here. So this slide we were really excited about because this is also a good validation of um, kind of next steps. So when we asked them what are the most trustworthy when it comes to communicating about developments in the city, the city of Malden website was represented at 61%, um, the highest of all of all potential. So I thought that was great. We're excited that you've got 61% people um, going to the website and getting information and willing to do that. Um, and so that will also be a great inspiration for additional communication. Um, the newsletter is also highly rated um, and highly recognized. So that is really uh, a great um, confirmation of what's already being done. Local TV news and the Greenville News and Gville Today follow that, um, uh, although with the traditional news a little higher. And then uh, we thought the signage on development site was a great uh, uh, a great detail as well as something to think about um, for folks who maybe aren't consuming traditional news as much but are out and about in the community um, that signage is something that you know 23% uh, of people would trust and notice. Um, and I think something else to note here is that social media as a trusted resource does not appear until after that with only 23% trusting Facebook and 13% trusting next door. And so it's um, you know further and further down. So I think it's good to know that everyone still thinks that the city is the authority on this topic um, and that there's a great opportunity to communicate even more. Um, so we asked folks for a question uh, or a word to describe Malden. Um, and again, with the other word cloud, just kind of an interesting look at what uh, where people's minds kind of go um, and just kind of a good cross section um, with growing and home first, but then, you know, small um, and, you know, some, uh, busy kind of next. And then um, some of that balance of that congestion traffic, um, you know, outdated in there as well. So um, an opportunity to kind of look at some of those as development continues. Um, so here we tried to ask people about their awareness about specific projects so that we also knew what needed more communication. Um, Bridgeway Station does have the highest awareness, um, but nearly 40% 40 40 of respondents still weren't familiar with it. So that could that could be different now um, after the news about the soccer stadium, um, but still pretty interesting given that that project has been in the works for some time. Um, Maverick Station was right behind it, so that's great. Um, the pedestrian bridge also very highly recognized and the Malden Cultural Center, 53% of respondents were familiar with it, which I think is great, but also presents a great opportunity for the 47% who weren't familiar with it. Um, and then uh, some of the other projects, which y'all are working on, but maybe uh, haven't discussed as much, fall a little lower on that list, which just presents additional opportunity. And then as far as how appealing these projects are, Maverick Station actually um, edged out Bridgeway Station as first here um, and Cultural Center as well. The multi-use pathway, people are very excited about that one too. And uh, the pedestrian bridge into Bridgeway Station. So I think 
uh, this is all consistent with what you might expect, but kind of good in confirming um, what, what people are watching and what people might um, like to learn a little bit more about. And then there's a second slide in the uh, other presentation that has a little more kind of a second follow-up question to that. Um, another word cloud that we used here highlights a little bit more of this anonymous surveys focus on traffic road development um, as it relates to concerns. This specifically was asking for concerns. Um, so these were the ones that bubbled up to the top. And oh, okay. And then our survey concluded with asking folks about their dining and recreation per preferences. Um, so kind of the takeaway from this was that about 60% of survey respondents reported dining out for meals in Malden more than once a month. So that could be weekly, daily, um, at least more than once a month. Um, however, that same statistic for dining outside of Malden was up at 80%. Um, so a big jump from the 60%. And then when it focused on uh, entertainment or recreational activities, about half of respondents say they rarely or never choose Malden for their entertainment or recreational activities. Um, and 71% uh, leave Malden once more than once a month for recreational activities. So I um, thought that was something good to keep in mind as well um, as everything comes together and continues. And then these are just some of the key takeaways that we have uh, gathered from what we've done so far and have informed our continuing work on the communication plan. Um, Malden, the city of Malden and its residents are both ready to find connectivity and create additional identity for the city, particularly around the city center developments. I do feel like, especially with perhaps our serve the stakeholder interviews, city center did bubble up quite a bit um, as far as something people were very excited about. So I think that's good. Um, stakeholders are hungry for more proactive and consistent information sharing. Um, I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. And the people um, are what Mald make people, uh, the people are what make Malden so special. We heard that a lot of times, especially in those stakeholder interviews. Um, outside of word of mouth, the city website, social media channels, and local news are the primary, and in some of these cases, the most trusted sources of news, um, which was great to hear. Many support development, but are concerned about the sustainable infrastructure, and people are ready for increased dining and entertainment options where we are today. Um, and from here, we are going to be working with Brandon and the team on uh, developing a communication plan and working on towards executing it. What's the potential timeline for that? Um, I think so we have worked on our side on uh, kind of our thoughts around communication plan and shared that with the team, but want to get some of their feedback on that further. And then I think we had talked about um, working with y'all. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, <clears throat> the thought was to have a council workshop to allow Crawford Strategy to come in and present the communication plan, but also a, a, in a format that allow council to be able to provide feedback and actually work through the actual plan because it's, it's quite in, involved um, to go through each step of their communication plan and uh, the committee uh, format may not provide the time that's needed to actually sit down and walk through the plan. So uh, I would recommend that uh, we have the clerk to council, Cindy Miller, poll council on a date to have a workshop to discuss the communication plan. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Uh, any questions from the committee? All right, thank you all. Thank you very much. And with that, we have no unfinished business, no new business, and we have our second public comment period, if anybody would like to provide that. Hearing none, committee concerns. All right, then uh, I'm, I'm going to take the floor for, for a quick second. Um, this committee and this council um, last month approved a resolution for Project Kick, the worst kept secret in Greenville County right now. Um, that, that resolution, um, I need to be very upfront, it does not provide any dollars, it does not attach any money, it does not deal with any taxes, it provides the ability 
for the city of Malden to talk. Um, that resolution currently resides with Greenville County Council's Finance Committee. Um, I would hope that they would see it in their wisdom to pass the same resolution and to forward it on to full county council to authorize Greenville County to talk because we can't define what a public-private partnership is going to look like, should, could like, should look like, could look like until the parties sit down together to talk. It's very simple. Um, we have the opportunity to do something that very few governmental entities get to do, and that's get a do-over. When the Greenville Braves left um, several years ago, the city of Malden had the opportunity to potentially have a double-A baseball team here within the city. And for various and sundry reasons, things did not work out. I am excited with the drive. I'm excited to have Fleur Field in the West End. I hope that the Major League Baseball situation gets taken care of quickly so that we get spring training and I get to go to a baseball game again. But the city of Malden has the opportunity now to potentially activate something new, something incredible in Bridgeway Station, um, working in concert with Greenville County and other parties for matters relating to Project Bridgeway Station. So I would simply ask that Greenville County Council uh, go ahead as soon as practical and approve the resolution forward it to full council so that full council can take up the resolution for project kick those are my committee concerns tonight what do i hear on adjournment so, so moved. moved second then we have a motion and a second is there a discussion hearing none all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed ayes have it we are adjourned at 652 all right call to order the uh, public works committee uh today February 7th, it is 6.54. Uh, we have a uh, full committee here. Um, Carol King, my, uh, Mr. Michael Reynolds, myself, and Mr. Madden, and Mr. Fleeman are all here today. Um, first, first item up, uh, public comment. Do we have any public comments? Nothing? All right, we'll move forward. Reading and approval of minutes. What do I hear? Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Like sign? Ayes have it. Sorry, there's no converse, uh, no discussion. I apologize. Was there any discussion to be had? Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Report or communication from city officers. Mr. Fleeman. Good evening. Uh, as far as our municipal, I mean, uh, our, our budgets go, we need approximately 39% at this point in time. Our, our budgets are right where they need to be and they all range somewhere from uh, basically 41 to 48% where, where we need to be. <clears throat> That's all I have for budget. Um, on the any questions, budget. Okay, with that, uh, the um, road paving list update. All right. So what you have in front of you is uh, information only. Um, if you remember, uh, in the December uh, council meeting, you guys approved uh, the agreement to uh, the, for the road paving for the upcoming year uh, with the expenditures of six hundred fifteen thousand uh, dollars, four hundred eight. From us, well, <clears throat> well, actually, no, it's, excuse me, 423 from us, and then a municipal match of 191 for a total of 615,408. Um, what I've included here is actually the list of the two and a half miles that we plan to pave during this uh, calendar year. Okay. Right. Um, as, I, as I said before, this is information only. Uh, I would like to point out that um, I will be working with the, the police department. Um, 
in regards to the Forester Creek speed humps. If you notice, the Forester Creek is in year three. The whole neighborhood's listed in here. Um, we'll just have to coordinate um, if the speed humps get approved, or perhaps they might have to wait until the paving activities are complete. <clears throat> Um, one additional item which was brought to my attention, and I apologize, is that um, in, your, in, your pack, in your packet on the last page, there is a, a request, uh, information only authorization for the city administrator in regards to the public works facility. However, it did not get included in the new business. Um, <clears throat> um, in accordance with our, our, our uh, purchasing policy, the city administrator is allowed to um, make financial decisions to a threshold. This is below the threshold. Long and short, um, we, we'd like to modify the second bay of our fleet department to accommodate uh, the new fire trucks. They, they are a little bit higher than what we have capacity for. Um, so we went out and received quotes to replace the doors, um, cut the openings to make them larger to allow for all of the city owned vehicles to go inside our fleet department. Um, as far as total revenue, um, the transfer that the city administrator would be authorizing would be taking monies that are available because of the HVAC expenditures, which are in the capital budget, which are being now funded out of the ARPA funding. Um, that's $155,000 and we're, we're just transferring 15. Questions on that? So, so uh, Mr. Fleming, I'm sorry. Any questions? No, I'm good. Uh, Mr. Fleming, so you do not need council approval or committee approval for that, uh, for the, the improvement to the bay. You're just giving us the knowledge and make sure there's no objections, correct? Yes, in accordance with city policies, uh, that, that authorization authority has been granted to the city administrator. Okay. But just for the sake of. Understood. Let you guys know. I think it's a good move personally. Um, either of you like to express have any issues or concerns about this? No, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Administrator, thank for you. moving forward with it. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Fleeman? Okay, let's move on. Mr. Chair, there's one other thing, Matt, I think you, you were going to talk about on the uh, road paving. There's one road that um, needed to be added because it was in that area? Yes, yes. So we have a, a five-year paving plan, right? And we they are all ranked based on PCI scores, which is a fancy way of saying how bad your road is. Um, when we were putting the list together, when we were getting door, towards the end to, to make it so it fit within the range of what we proposed, um, my recommendation was to move Forester Creek Way onto the list, even though it fell in year four. The reason for that decision was because we were already paving the other three roads in the neighborhood. And it just made sense the, to, to push that road in so that we wouldn't have to incur a mobilization cost on another roadway within the city. Thank you for interrupting me, and it made me rem remember one other thing that I was I did, did not include that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, several months ago, uh, City Administrator and Recreation Department brought to my attention the opportunity uh, through Palmetto Pride to seek out uh, grant funds to assist in litter pickup within the City of Malden. Um, it was in the news. I don't know whether or not you guys happened to read the article, but City of Malden was one one of the the handful of top um, award winners, we received $25,000. Uh, we're gonna be using those funds to um, assist with litter pickup throughout the city. We came up with a litter uh, pickup plan, how those funds would be expended. Um, but I just wanted to let you guys know that I work with recreation, submitted the grant, we are awarded <clears throat> top value. Excellent. Job. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Clarification, uh, Mr. Administrator, I wouldn't call that an interruption as much as an encouragement, first off. <laughs> Secondly, um, thank you, Mr. Fleeman, for working together with other departments and continuing to um, enhance the city landscape and beautification process. So thank you for coordinating with other departments and certainly having a good team together led by the administrator and making sure the 
departments are talking is your job, Mr. Madden, so well done. That's all I have, Mr. Yep. Chairman, thank you. All right, if that does it, we'll move to the next item, unfinished business. There is none, so let's go to new business. <clears throat> to Sunset Drive. So yes, so um, a resident at 122 Sunset Drive has reached out to the city. Um, we have been out there previously. We, we hand dug the ditch line. The resident was very pleased. Um, however, after some review, she felt it would aesthetically be more pleasing if her ditch was piped. Um, in your packet, you can see the correspondence between Public Works and the resident. Um, in accordance with our uh, city ordinances and the, uh, the stormwater policy, city will offer if, if after determination that it's not going to impact drainage in the roadway, it's not going to affect neighbors' drainage, that we will offer up um, labor and equipment and cover material if they pay for the materials themselves. And so we have worked, we, I worked with the uh, um, Ms. Ward, I gave her different options. One was just to pipe in front of her house on sun, sun, sunset. The other one was the pipe on sunset and Pinecrest. And she determined, even after looking at the figures, that she wanted both of them them piped. Um, and so in accordance with our policies, um, Public Works recommends that we do this work. Um, we will we'll be expending, we'll, we will be accepting funds because she has to pay for the materials. So that's why I'm bringing this before you. Um, staff anticipates that, you know, you know, the call out locates, this should take us five to 10 working days, give or take, depending on utilities and, and such. Um, but I can, I can guarantee you, like you, we spoke, Mr. Cranley before, it, it's not gonna impact the neighbors. It's a corner lot. Um, we'll be intercepting the, the pipe from underneath the street in the catch basin and then connecting the uh, driveway culverts as well. Um, it, it, it's per perfectly uh, an acceptable job to do, and I, I believe that uh, um, we should move forward with it. <clears throat> and just, just to be clear, one more time, I know you said it, but that this policy, we're putting this in because it will not affect the stormwater. While, while we're going through the city, improving stormwater, where we do have to create ditches or dig ditches out, this may not be an option. It might be an option, but it's not a blanket statement that we'll do that anywhere because sometimes you do need the volume of a ditch, which, and just to be clear, so thank you. All right, um, what do I hear? Um, I, I do not believe that you have to take action on this. Oh. Okay. No, uh, just to, for clarification, um, action is needed. It's an agreement uh, tied to this uh, with the property owner, but it is clear the responsibilities of the city and the property owner as it relates to this project. So the agreement that's in your agenda package essentially outlines that the property owner agrees to pay for the, the materials, uh, that, that, that there'll be a whole harmless uh, uh, form, uh, and also that this is a uh, one time to, to, to make the repair. Well, to actually not make the repair, but just to pipe the ditch. Free option was the ditch. This is a cough. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, summon his name, but has the city attorney looked over what we're looking at doing here? Yes, uh, the, this, the reason why it's here for approval. Uh, the agreement was drafted uh, by the uh, attorney. Very good. Thank um, you. Okay. So public Works, would historically, I, I guess we're trying to change things with Public Works, but historically they never had agreements. They just did what they did, so. This is new for all of us. Thank so you, Mr. Plaintiff. We do not need a motion. We do. Yes. That's what I thought. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to forward to full council the um, stormwater improvement um, recommendation for 122 Sunset Drive. 
I have a motion to forward to full council in this agreement. Do I have a second? I'll second it. A second. Any discussion? All right. Um, those in favor of forwarding to full council this agreement, please say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. On to the next item. All right, what you have in front of you is an approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Metro Connects regarding sewer service and annexation. Uh, we've, we've had uh, executive sessions on the matter. Uh, this intergovernmental agreement has been through our attorney as well as their attorney. And, and what you have before you is uh, the end product. It basically outlines their authority, our rights, what we can see to what they can see to as far as annexation and, and, and sewer service provider. Um, there is no fiscal impact to this uh, except for a potentially loss of revenue. Um, but at this point, staff recommends the approval of the intergovernmental agreement. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to move forward to full council with a recommendation of approval of the intergovernmental agreement with Metro Connects in your packet. I have a motion. Uh, do I have a second? All right, with that, uh, any discussion? All right, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. If the ayes have it, and this will be moved to full council for approval, potential approval. All right. Uh, next item, amendment to solid waste or, uh, ordinance. Yes, so back again um, is the amendment to the solid waste ordinance in in regards to um, contractors stockpiling leaves in the city right away. Um, this went through committee before, was uh, brought before city council and it has been returned. Right. <clears throat> so on this um, item, uh, like us to uh, consider this, go back and review. We've had a number of uh, citizens come back to us. Uh, a couple items have popped up. One. Uh, so the citizens felt like they paid for the leave pickup through their taxes, and so why would they pay twice? Okay, one comment. Actually, it was two comments right after each other, so I think they talked to one another. <laughs> um, and the other item being is our enforcement of the uh, business licenses within the city. If we're going to make this, if we're going to pass this going forward and, and enforcing it, if those with business licenses may incur additional costs as those who are not, not following the rules, making sure that we enforce it so we're not putting some people out of business because some people are cheating and going around. So I'd like to have some considerations of what we can do for both of these items, how to make this a better, better verbiage, and if there's anything we can do to improve that enforcement. That's, that's why I requested to have it back. I also know that some other members of the committee may have had some additional concerns as well. Ms. King. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I concur with what you say. At, 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 I'm still struggling with this one. Um, at first, I, I agreed with the amendment wholeheartedly. Um, I actually did not hear from any of our residents. I simply just struggled after the meeting and thinking it through. Um, is there how are we going to enforce it? Number one, number two, um, for lack of a better word, is it right to punish those folks that um, are unable to get out and do their um, grass cutting themselves, um, and and not give them the services that we would give someone who's putting their own leaves out on the curb? So I, you know, I think we need to think this through. Um, I don't think there's any urgency to passing it and forwarding it tonight. Um, and we may circle back around to the same conclusion that this is what we need to do. But I, I for one, need a little bit more time to, to look at some other options when it comes to this, whether that's educating our, um, or making um, the landscape folks a little bit more conscious of, of course, it's in the ordinance so they can legally leave the leaves out. So I, I just think we need to, to, to discuss it a little bit more and think if there's any other options other than um, the ordinance, the way it's being presented to be amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Yeah, so so as I thought about this one coming out of committee and after we after it went out of committee and went to council, this was a struggle I had with it. And, and it's for me, it still comes back to um, to A, enforcement, which I mentioned in the last meeting. Um, and then as well as the thing I struggle with is taking an, an item and creating a bigger issue. So when I kind of weighed this through, my thought was, where does it stop? Does it leave? Does it kind of extrapolating it out? And, and while I completely, and I said at that meeting, I completely understand what our um, uh, Mr. Fleeman was bringing forward and trying to do is, is to give a better schedule that's easier to pick up, reduce the load to the city. I certainly agree with that and, and understand where that was coming from. But uh, if I have a bug man, come to my house and spray for bugs? Am I going to make him take those bugs with him? If I have a maid, I don't. <laughs> Let's be clear. I don't have a maid, but I'm not going to, if she takes my trash out, I'm not going to make it take it with her. It's the same trash. It's going to be there no matter what, right? So, and that's where I struggle with this is who's putting the leaves on the curb isn't of much concern to me is the leaves are going to be there either way. Um, while we could reduce the load to the department, I don't, I, I tend to think it's minor and Maybe I'm wrong in that, but it's probably mitigatable in the amount that this is going to do, especially without being able to enforce it well. Um, you know, there are certain things, tree trimming, uh, a tree being cut down, that's an obvious thing that, that they need to haul off an entire tree. That makes complete sense to me. Um, but so I'm, I'm still stuck on, I'm certainly willing to look at it and see how we can help mitigate the strain on city during those seasons, I don't have a great way to do that off the top of my head, um, but I'm certainly willing to listen to all ideas. Yes, <clears throat> Ms. Ms. Brandon, um, I mean, Mr. Madden, um, so in this one, we would, the, the ideal thing would be to, if, if we can agree to this, to hold in committee uh, and not forward, of course, and then come back and circle around to this again. Yes, that's, that's correct. Absolutely. All right. Do I hear a motion? Mr. May Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we hold this, uh, this item in committee for further discussion and give council members a, a chance to reach other to other non-committee members and talk more about other options that we could do to help uh, facilitate this. Second that motion. We're going to have a second. All right, with that, do we have any more discussion? With that, um, vote. Those in favor of holding this in committee, this item in committee, please state aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. The ayes have it, and this will be held in committee. Okay. All right. With that, uh, no additional new business. That covers all that. Public comments. Do we have any comments? Mr. Madden, anything on those? No, oh, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. With that, um, what do let's see? Uh, committee concerns. Do you have any? I have none, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Me neither. All right. Well, actually, I do. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. In speaking of that, um, uh, kudos to I had a chance to attend an HOA meeting, a local HOA meeting, HOA meeting uh, recently that Public Works as well as Police and Fire came up in that meeting um, when the tree was down on. Hamby, there was actually several citizens within the Forster Wood subdivision that were pleased with how quickly Public Works responded, how quickly they got everything out. They opened the road up quickly. So there was actually a round of applause in an HOA meeting, which is kind of like getting one here. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so from the uh, citizens of Forster Woods, there's an appreciation to Public Works for a particular incident, as well as police and fire. Excellent. Concerns. All right. With that, what do I hear about adjournment? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. With that, those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Okay. I am going to call the Building Codes Committee to order. It is February the 7th at 7:18 p.m. All council members are present, as well as our city administrator and uh, David Deerhog.
first of all, we have public comment. Is there anyone who would like to make public comment? All right, hearing none, what do I hear on reading and approval of the minutes from December the 6th? Move for approval. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, are there any discussion changes? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, then uh, motion carries. Uh, next, we have the reports from our BDS director. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, committee members. Uh, two things I'll touch on tonight. First of all, I'll give you a report on our budget. Through the end of January, the ideal remaining percentage would be 41%, and we've had, we have 43% remaining in our budget, so we're in good shape so far. I will comment though and let you know there is one thing that we're watching very carefully in our budget and that is um, respect to our professional services that we budget for. Uh, we use a third party contractor to help fill in from time to time with our building inspection load. And so we have had to use them a little bit more over the last few months. So we're continuing to watch that carefully um, and trying to make sure that we still are within budget. So, but other than that, we're in great shape right now. The other thing that I will report on tonight is to let you know that we do currently have two openings on our planning commission. We've advertised those openings. Um, they're both created because we have two members uh, who have had work-related conflicts arise that have necessitated them to resign from the planning commission. One is, took a job out of state and so he will no longer live here. And the other is taking a job actually as a planning director for another community and um, his schedule be, will be such that he won't be able to meet the demands of the planning commission any longer. So we have not got any applicants yet for you to interview, but we'll look forward to scheduling that once we do get some applicants for you to consider. That's all I have for the report tonight. If there's any questions you have, I'll be more than glad to answer those. Great, thank you. Any questions? Mr. Matney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, David. Uh, I spoke with the administrator the other day about um, a situation with some banners over at Malden High School uh, and getting them on the polls. Are we going to be able to get that on the Planning Commission agenda so we can start moving that? It is uh, scheduled for the Planning Commission. I've already sent out the notice to the newspaper, which is, should have been advertised already that they're needing to review that. Thank you very much. All right, uh, there is no unfinished business, so we have new business. Um, an ordinance to provide for the annexation of property at 220 Fowler Circle, Mr. Deerhart. Thank you, Madam Chair. This may look like a familiar item. This is one that the committee and the council have considered before. Um, let me just give you a little background. This is a petition for the annexation of about 10 acres at 220 Fowler Circle. Uh, you may recall that uh, the latter part of last year, there was a petition submitted to annex this property and zone it for RM zone, RM1 zoning district. Uh, the expectation at that time was to develop the property for about 50 to 80 townhomes. That proceeded to the committee and on to city council, uh, but uh, at the city council me meeting on November 15th, uh, the council voted 6-1 to reject the annexation at that time. This has come back now uh, with a petition from the from Zenith Holdings, who Zenith Real Estate was the representative last time working with the property owners at that time last year. They've since closed on the property. They own it now. They've come back with a petition to annex this with a different zoning classification. The classification they're requesting is the R15 residential zoning district. Um, and what they are anticipating now is to develop the property for about 28 detached single family homes with a starting sales price uh, approximately $450,000 and up. The applicant expects that new style communities will be the builder for this project and they would establish an age targeted community for adults ages 55 and up. Uh, new style communities provides maintenance free all brick homes. The maintenance of the homes and the community is paid for through the HOA. Uh, sewers not presently available at this property 
But uh, Zenith Real Estate expects to construct a new sewer line on West Butler Road via Grow Circle that will connect to the rear of this property. Due to the topography of this site in relation to the existing sewer line, a lift station will also be needed. Uh, I don't believe there's been a study yet to determine the fee that may be, need to be levied on the prospective homeowners in order to support the costs associated with the lift station, but I understand that they're working on that. Uh, the tract is currently located in the Malden Fire Service area, and the City of Malden will continue to provide the fire protection services to that tract. And uh, we have done a brief analysis of the fiscal impact for the annexation of this property subject to, and, and as well as planning for it to be developed for 28 homes at the selling point that I mentioned earlier. Uh, staff projects that the develop will generate, development will generate an annual revenue of approximately 38 to $40,000, the main Sources of that revenue come through real property taxes, uh, as well as franchise fees, personal property taxes, state aid to subdivisions, sewer maintenance fees, and then some other marginal revenues. The staff projects that the cost of providing services to this development will be approximately thirty-two dollars to $34,000 annually. Uh, this does not include the cost of maintaining the sewer lift station, which will be associated with a separate fee that will be levied on the property owners within the development. That summarizes the report from staff on this petition. Uh, the applicant and their engineer are here this evening. So if you have any other questions about this project, they are available to answer those if you wish, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Deerhog. Um, so some of the concerns from November <clears throat> kind of still exist to me. Um, there was concern about the city's responsibility for maintaining an operation of a sewer lift station. There was concern about the amount of fees that may need to be levied on property owners to support the ongoing maintenance of the lift station. There was confusion about whether the lift station would serve additional development projects, which I believe it will on Rose Circle. Uh, there was concern about stormwater issues. At the time, there was opposition from neighboring property owners along Fowler Circle regarding townhomes. I don't know how they feel about um, the single family development. I guess I do have questions uh, regarding the sewer lift station. Um, so maybe the developers could come up and address that. And I'll invite them to introduce themselves, their name for your records. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. My name is Colton Miller. Um, I work for Zenith Real Estate. We're the applicant and uh, current owner of the project. Regarding the lift station um, and regarding the, the concerns that existed prior, I wanted to maybe briefly touch on some items that we feel like we intentionally addressed, and then I can speak to those specific points that you mentioned that perhaps still exist. So the first off regarding the townhomes, that was a sticking point for the neighbors. Naturally, that made sense right across from, uh, you know, Mald one of Malden's premier you know, recreational areas in Sunset Park. We've since entirely changed the product type, which halved our density. We're now at 28 rather than just slightly over two times 28 uh, units there. Furthermore, we have almost doubled the starting price by contracting with new style communities. They're, as just as Mr. Deerhog said, uh, they're based out of Greenville and Charlotte and exclusively build 55 plus all brick maintenance free communities. And so uh, they have a number of positive externalities that I think really benefit this site, particularly where it is and the pace of life that is associated with this particular area of the county. And because, so for 55 plus one, I think tremendous thing about them is that because the average resident in this community is between 68 and 69 years old and has no children, I think there's an average uh, residence per home of just 1.3 residents per home. And so very, very low population here. And because of their age, they have the flexibility to drive at off peak times. And so I'd be happy to provide you with a traffic study commissioned by New Style and performed by the University of Delaware 
that demonstrate that during peak hours, these communities, age 55 and up communities, generate one third of the traffic in the AM and PM peak hour times. And over the course of the full day, only two thirds of the traffic. So that's one of the first positive externalities that exist with a 55 plus community. Regarding the lift station, I think there is an additional positive externality besides others that I could mention, but specifically addressing the lift station, I think because this is a 55 plus community all maintained by the HOA, we then have an expectation of the future residents that there will be high HOA fees. So it's not like there is a, a burdensome, they're gonna be shocked with a sticker price of any type of um, you know, levy by a special tax district here. In fact, I calculated the, the annual uh, price of owning a home here. And so for instance, I, I, I then made, okay, I asked myself, what is the percentage? If I went in increments of 100 on the annual fee levied by the city to maintain the pump station, if it's $100 a year, it's 0.36% of the annual cost of home ownership. If it's $200, it's 0.72%, so not even 1%. In order to break 1%, you have to get into the $300 and $400 per year range. And so that would be still be at $400 a year, you'd be at 1.45%. So as far as the, you know, I don't think that, and, and naturally, they're going to know ahead of time what the fees are in these communities. So I don't think that these will be particularly burdensome on the residents regarding the lift station. As far as maintenance, I have reached out to the public works director, Mr. Fleeman and Mr. Madden and talked through both the, the logistics of executing the special tax district that would uh, provide explicitly for the, the funding of uh, said lift station. And Mr. Fleeman has indicated his comfort with our setup. Um, just a minor correction. Uh, to Mr. Deerhaug's introduction, the sewer would come down Fowler Circle, so from Butler Road south to Fowler Circle, and would enter the, the property that's highlighted currently and service both this and the next item of business, the Rose Circle uh, projects as well. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and pause there, and perhaps ask Madam Chair uh, what further questions I can answer for you um, regarding the lift station maintenance, et cetera. Did you have any kind of um, cost for the lift station um, because these are small communities so you you'll have um, so based on that and the cost of the lift station then I guess you would divide that out between the residents, correct? It, it is a little bit opaque to me as far as the, and I asked Mr. Fleeman and Mr. Madden, perhaps they can become more specific on this it, because it is a third party, not the city themselves who's performing this analysis, how exactly the engineers would determine the proper funding level and then divide. What I do understand, if I can summarize what Mr. Madden was saying is they set a, a proper funding level as well as a, a seed request that the developer could potentially you know, to even lower the monthly, or sorry, the annual payment, we would be willing to provide that seed money to the project. They would then take the proper funding level as set by the third party engineer and divide it by the number of units that would be served by the project. And then that would then determine the annual cost um, that they would contribute, each resident would, resident would contribute. So they would contribute that to the homeowners association or would um, they pay that separately per year? In their allow taxes? me to direct that to Mr. Madden. Yep, Ms. Kuzner, that's correct. They would pay it separately. It would be levied on their tax bill every year. Okay, so if it's three or $400, I was gonna bring, uh, my name is Jay Martin. I'm with Arbor Land Design. Um, I wanted to bring to attention a subdivision that was formally uh, done, approved, it's almost uh, built out right now is the retreat at Bethel and Bridges Road. Uh, that's 44 lots and it required at the time a lift station because we couldn't get the gravity up through the adjacent property only to serve it. Uh, that's 44 lots running off of a lift station. So this is, is quite a bit more. But also when you get into the design of a lift station like this, it's not just going to serve uh, those two communities, this and the next one. 
but anything that develops in the sub watershed above it would be accounted for that could be handled by that so that it also opens up the opportunity for those areas to be developed in the future if necessary. Uh, there's also the fact, and we surely wished uh, that the adjacent property was going to proceed at this time, but they're not proceeding to development at this time. So what would occur in the future with the lift station where it is that we would provide easements from above and below so that if this, um, if the development below us came online, the lift station could move to that lower point and then the force main and the gravity, the gravity would go down to it. A force main would come up the same easement to connect to the whole thing so that it kind of works together so that you don't end up with three or four lift stations in there. The point of a lift station station is to provide for multiple developments. So off the bat, it's two developments. There's the, the ability to serve more above and then to relocate in size the lift station if more below comes online. Okay, thank you. Anyone have any questions? Mr. Matney. Thank you, Ms. Kuzner. Jay, thank you. I was actually getting ready to ask Brandon uh, about the, the pump station out there. And so you, you actually hit on that for me. So I, I, I appreciate it. One of the other things that was really good. And uh, when we, cause I, I think you were here when we dealt through that yeah. and, and you, you remember uh, Mr. Black was, uh, he, he wrote us hard uh, in a good way to make sure that we develop the appropriate standard. And if you remember the generator and, and the fueling for a generator so that you never had it come offline and it had a, a source to it without having to go renew the source if you had to go to generation. So we've set all the standards that were there. As far as I know, that lift station has been performing very well. There is now a home, although some aren't in complete on every single lot in there. So it is near closeout. And I think it's performed very well for those 44 lots. And I think the, um, the way the tax district was done there would be done here. And so, uh, it sets a good scenario. It also sets a scenario if we see there that there's any issues that we could resolve that this one might improve that. No, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I want to ask Mr. Madden a question based off of that information. Mr. Madden, the discussion was you know, not only could this particular pump station serve these two communities, but those that go above and below it. Um, if communities expanded that were served by that lift station, would they be included in this district so that the annual cost uh, that residents are having to pay for the lift station, would that eventually go down because it becomes spread across more people? Or would the people in this subdivision be the ones that are continuing to pay for the pump station uh, through the course of its life and the folks that were benefiting from it in new places wouldn't have to pay for it. That's correct, Mr. Madney. If it's uh, everyone who's served by this pump station will have to levy that fee. So if you have, for example, 200 property owners and all of their flow is going through that pump station, all 200 property owners will, will be levied a fee for the city maintaining and operating that pump station. So it would go down if it expanded out. Thank you very much. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Mr. Algun. This is really a question for the two of you being on this committee before. One of the final things on here was concerns over stormwater issues. I don't know what the concerns were the last time and whether or not they have addressed what the concern was from last time. One of the concerns or the biggest concern, when we go through the process, our first step, we have to go through subdivision advisory committee uh, with Greenville County. And they had pointed out that they believed that the stormwater detention facility was not large enough to handle it, even though we had it drawn on, on the plan. And early on, we don't have all the dimensions that are necessary. It's early on in engineering. Uh, I do believe it would have handled it. But in this situation, because of the, the layout changed, it creates more space for the stormwater to occur. We are required by law to handle the stormwater on the site. We have to we cannot allow more water to leave the site than currently leaves the site. And we cannot allow it to leave the site in an unlike manner to how it currently leaves the site. Those 
are reviewed by Greenville County. They're re-reviewed by uh, the uh, state before we're given an MPDS permit and grading can ensue on site. So all those things have to be in order and have to meet the criteria or we cannot get a permit on site. Thank you. Madam Chair, if, if, if I may, sure. um, because Mr. Allgood just jogged something in my, in my head that I need to ask. So uh, Colton, I think y'all did a really good job in reducing the number of structures and going from the RM to R15. So you're creating a bigger lot. And by having the single family detached instead of having a townhome community, are you also not reducing the amount of impervious surface in that community so that you've got the ground that'll be able to soak up some of this storm water? Yes, sir. That did occur to me as that I, I should mention that very thing. So yes, as we're decreasing that, it would decrease the demand that would otherwise have been existing prior. But as Mr. Martin mentioned, we did even expand the stormwater capacity. Well, I did happen to go online and look at New Style Communities, and, and they do have a nice product. Yes, ma'am. All right, anything further? Okay, what do I hear on a motion? Move record it to full council. All right, motion and a second. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. The motion carries. Next on the agenda is the ordinance to provide for the annexation of property at 110 Rose Circle. Mr. Deerhog. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. This one also sound familiar because this came to the committee back in November, um, although at that point in time it was held in committee while the committee awaited the outcome of the annex an annexation petition at 220 Fowler Circle, which we just talked about. So let me refresh you on this annexation petition. This is a petition from the current property owners who are David and Karen Cumbia, uh, represented though tonight by Zenith Real Estate who are um, planning to purchase the property from them. The uh, Proposal for this property at this current time is that Zenith Real Estate anticipates de developing the property for 34 detached single family homes uh, with a starting sales price of approximately $450,000 and up. I just want to note that this is a slight change from what was reported to the committee in November. At that point in time, they were planning for, or it was presented that they were planning for 32 homes that would sell in the 300s. So um, this is two more homes and a significantly higher price point. Uh, also for this project, the applicant expects that new style communities will be the builder for this project and establish a community similar to the one that we just talked about for the property at Fowler Circle. Um, this has the similar issues relating to sewer and we just talked about that with the property at Fowler Circle. So the same lift station that they would construct for the project at Fowler Circle would also serve this community that we're talking about at Rose Circle. Uh, I'll just conclude with the fiscal impact that staff has performed on this annexation uh, petition. Staff projects that the development will generate an annual revenue of approximately $46,000 to $48,000. Um, the reason this is up a little bit from the others because there's more homes on this property. Uh, city staff projects that the cost of providing services to this development will be approximately thirty-eight dollars to $40,000 annually. Uh, again, that does not include the cost of maintaining the sewer lift station, which will be involved with a separate fee that will be levied. That concludes the report from staff. Glad to answer any questions. And again, you have the app. Uh, representative for the applicant and the engineer here to answer questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Deerhog. I do have a question for you. Um, on the RM1 zoning, it allows for a minimum of 6,000 square foot lot for detached single family homes. 
um, attached single family homes and cluster housing developments can be developed at a maximum density of 12.5 units per acre. So this will just be for the detached single family homes. Um, so this is not like any kind of a mixed use, it's just the, the single family homes. Yeah, so I'll give you a little clarification on the RM1 district. The RM1 district does allow a broader range of, of residential types. Uh, it does allow the detached single family homes like we're talking about for this project, but it also allows for townhomes, um, which could be a possibility. I haven't really talked to the applicant about this, but obviously they are proposing to underdevelop this property in relation to the zoning district they've asked for. Um, they might be amenable to going ahead and, and considering a comparable zoning district to what they're gonna do on the Fowler Circle property, but I'll defer to him and let him speak more to that. But, but yes, to answer where you're going, RM1 district does allow for more density in, in different home types, um, but they are proposing to vastly undevelop it in relation to the RM district, and it certainly could be suitable to just consider a different zoning district on this track. Okay, so, but if somewhere down the line, they decided not to do the single family homes, they could do cluster housing, um, duplexes, things like that. Is that correct? Under RM1. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Mr. Deerheim or the applicant? Mr. Allred. With these two properties being so close together, I, yes, I would like to hear an answer to that, what was just posed to you, but also with these properties being so close together, would they connect in any way with roads? Excellent question. Um, I'll answer the second first, since it's the simpler of the two. No, sir, they wouldn't connect. There is a blue line stream that uh, bisects or separates the two. And um, so we have decided to treat them as entirely separate developments. Um, the north one, which is Rose, would be named Hawk Haven, and the one off of Fowler would be Riley Trace. So they'd be treated as entirely separate neighborhoods with entrance monuments, their own branding, et cetera. Uh, as, as to the, the question about RM1 itself and its suitability, super valid question. This, because as Mr. Deerhaug mentioned, this was held in committee previously. And whereas Fowler was fully rejected, this maintained its previous zoning request under our old, or our old uh, submission. So as of now, we've updated our application to be uh, with new style community at our new price point, et cetera. Now, in Simpsonville, we account encountered a similar situation in that where in order to get the density, or not the density we needed, in order to uh, support the layout that we submitted, we were applied for an, a zoning classification that did allow for multiple product types. At first, Simpsonville said they rejected it on the basis that exactly what you were saying, Hey, we love the idea here where no one wants to say no to the 55 plus community because, you know, in, in a lot of the communities in the upstate and the surrounding municipalities, it's, it's a unique offering. And so they weren't against that in any way, but they were concerned about the possibility of the alternate product type. And so naturally, you know, despite our willingness to deed restrict or, you know, show them our contract and, and uh, executive session, et cetera, with them, that was an understandable concern of theirs. And so what we did in Simpsonville was they rejected us and we reapplied at, at an ID, an innovative uh, development classification, which is a unique classification actually developed by Mr. Deerhaug uh, at his previous role. And it allows you to have one product type and the city can hold you to it. So it's like a PD. The difference between a PD and the ID is that with a PD, you have to have multiple use types or multiple, like a commercial and a residential, for instance. But in an in ID, the city has the ability to hold you to what you submit. So you get to write your own rules with that one use type. And we inquired about, does Malden have something like this? Because my preference would have been to submit both of them as something where you guys could hold us to so you feel comfortable knowing that we're gonna do what's on the paper naturally. So allow me to make two more quick points. Um, in this larger answer to your question, I, I 
perhaps a question you might wonder is why did we increase from 32 to 34? The prior submission, and um, I would be happy to show it to you, left the existing Cumbia house uh, in its current position. So it, it said, okay, we're gonna leave that house and develop a community going south and kind of like a spine formation uh, on the property. As we brought in new style, they decided that they indicated that the neighborhood would be more cohesive without the existing structure and would instead put two houses that would face the common road rather than one facing outward and it'd be unclear where the true entrance to the neighborhood was and instead treated as a true neighborhood. That's where the additional two units came from. And then lastly, unfortunately, I did inquire of, of our engineers the ability to drop to the R15 zoning classification and keep this number of units and we would have to lose units. However, it would be a marginal thing and we would be willing to acquiesce to council should they choose for us to do R15. I would ask maybe that there would be, like maybe our preference would be to stay with some kind of, there is a way that we could just have a, a development agreement or whatever. I guess if we'd have to start over with something like that and I'm willing to just workshop this in the moment, but if we would have to start over, naturally we would just start over at R15 rather than go through all the hoops associated with that. Another option that we could do, okay, Mr. Deerhog, um, hopefully a recommended R12 here as a potential option. Perhaps you could give me a, a, a brief overview of, of that in the moment. Uh, the one other thought that we had just a moment ago, because I did anticipate this question coming up was, now that we are the owners of Fowler Circle, we could do some kind of maneuver where we were to subdivide the, the back half, the western portion of Fowler Circle and attach it to Rose via recombination and thus increase Rose's total acreage to allow us to move to R15 and still, so that would assuage council's concern and would allow us to keep the 34 units that we were looking for. That, I have not gamed out the, how that would affect the schedule and that could affect it significantly. But maybe I'll go ahead and pause here. And we. <laughs> David, I just had a, a quick back and forth. He did the same calculation I did. Um, the biggest thing that kept us from R15 here is you lose one lot. You go from 34 to 33. Um, but if we applied to go R12, you raise the possible density from 2.9 to 3.6. It does limit what you can. It doesn't put all those other uses. And I believe provides the protection to the city of Malden that there's not gonna be another unit type here that is on the table, but it does require us to say, hey, let's consider R12 for this one. If you look in the surrounding areas, there's, you all have an RM on one side, there's some R20, the county has RS around it. Um, it legitimately, my argument would be R12 fits because there's RM over on one side of us and there's R20 and there's different residential, uh, but technically there's not another R12 on that side of Butler in that area. Um, but if that seems to be the zoning classification would answer and kind of resolve that situation, it, uh, it would uh, get, a, get rid of the loss of the one lot and make everything kind of move forward and protect you from townhomes, quite honestly, coming in later. Okay, thank you. I, th I think I would be more comfortable with the R12. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Um, since uh, since we are in committee, uh, I believe can we ask or request that that am amendment go forward in annexation and rezone and be that our change would be to R12 rather than R RM1, or does it have to be approved like it is? Madam. So Madam Chair, when I've talked to the city attorney about this in the past, what the city attorney has indicated to me is the council, when they receive an annexation petition, they have the authority to zone it whatever they wish. Um, generally those come in with a specific zoning classification that's requested, but the city council and what the city attorney has said in the past can zone it what they want. 
what you might consider in this case is if you're inclined to forward this to the full council um, is to do so with a recommendation that it be zoned R12 pending that there's no issues with the city attorney on this. Okay, thank you. Unless Mr. Madden has other insider comments to provide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deerhoff. Okay, any further questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, what do I hear on a motion? Move forward to full council with recommendation uh, that it be annexed at uh, a pending classification of R12. All right, do I hear a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? All right, hearing none, uh, all in favor of sending this annexation to full council with the rezoning classification of R12, say aye. 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 All right. Um, the motion carries. All right. Next up on the agenda is outdoor lighting standards. Mr. Deerhog. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. So staff has recently asked to examine and explore the opportunity to consider outdoor lighting standards that could apply in residential neighborhoods. Presently, the city of Malden has some outdoor lighting standards. Um, but these provisions do not apply to single family residential properties, um, even though single family residential properties might be the cause of glare and light pollution that other enter other single family properties. So the staff has um, looked at this and I've provided in your report a little summary of what our current standards include. As I've looked at other nearby jurisdictions, including Greenville County, the city of Simpsonville, and the city of Greer, they all have fairly comparable outdoor lighting standards to the city of Malden, and they likewise exempt single family residential properties from outdoor lighting standards. Um, as of our neighboring jurisdictions, it was only the city of Greenville that actually provides lighting standards that also apply at single family residential properties. And I've summarized their standards for you in the report that I've provided. Um, and I will just highlight real briefly the standards that they have in place to specifically regulate outdoor lighting at residential properties. Uh, they have limits on height, light fixtures within residential districts should either be wall mounted or mounted on wood, concrete, fiberglass, or painted metal poles that would be no higher than 15 feet above finished grade. Um, and then bollard type lighting fixtures can't have a height, uh, shall not have a height less than three feet, no more than four feet. And then they get into different luminaire types, how much wattage the bulb is, is essentially that might be installed. And depending on the wattage, they have standards about whether it needs to be a cutoff fixture um, or if there's other features that they have to incorporate. Uh, staff's presenting this at this time for the consideration of this committee and really seeking any input if you're interested in us pursuing an ordinance uh, to introduce outdoor lighting standards that would apply to residential properties, perhaps maybe similar to the city of Greenville standards. And that's uh, the conclusion of the report of staff. Thank you, Mr. Deerhog. Um, so I actually have an issue um, with lighting that is beaming in my windows. Um, I have had to pay out a couple thousand dollars to get blackout shades for my deck and blackout curtains for my upstairs bedrooms. Um, so I would really like to see something in our ordinance to protect neighbors from unintentional neighbors uh, putting in lighting that um, is intrusive and uh, <clears throat> 
this particular light, I've looked at it not only from my area, but also the other street. And it's even more offensive from the other street than it is to my property. Um, it's also flooding the side of another house. I just feel like Malden needs to um, protect residents from uh, these types of nuisances. Um, that is my opinion. And do y'all have anything to add? <laughs> My question for, which I guess would be for the city of Greenville because it's theirs, not ours, is the why. I mean, obviously I can understand that there's light that's intruding on a, on a person's home, but what type of light are we really talking about? Is it string lighting? Is it, you know, what, what is the cause that led to them to do what looks like pretty extensive work here? Did you get any feedback from the city of Greenville on why they have what they have? No, I didn't get into asking that type of question with them. Mainly I was just trying to ask them about what their standards are and making sure that they could explain to me how they uh, administer those standards. Okay. One thing that I will say is the, the light next door didn't work for 27 years. And then all of a sudden, the neighbors are redoing their backyard and wanting lights and not realizing, <clears throat> I guess, this is actually a street light. The pole has always been there. And there was a bulb at one time, uh, and, but the bulb never worked the entire time that we lived there. Um, but when Duke Power came back out, they put in the bright LED. It's now purple, right? It's not purple. It's not purple. Oh, no, it's it's very, very bright. <laughs> but come to find out, uh, the city owns that pole. So hopefully something is in the works. But I, I just feel like for, for the future and for other homeowners, we should ensure that if anything like this happens, they have some sort of recourse instead of um, having to go through the expense of shading their own property and not being able to enjoy uh, their own outdoors <clears throat> or indoors. <laughs> I, so. I will add to just for your own knowledge about the subject that Greenville County about eight to 10 years ago was looking at this issue. And from what I could glean, the main thing that was coming up as an issue is sometimes people will have Duke come out and install security lights on their property. And I think that was causing, well, apparently it was causing some issues from neighbors of where those security lights have been installed. And so, it came up as an issue with Greenville County and they looked at um, possible standards that they might consider, but uh, at the end, they ended up not adopting anything from out of all that. That's an interesting perspective because then you're talking about Duke coming in, let's say in, into any neighborhood or um, working out, a, someone requests a light, costs 200 bucks to put up and then they pay a fee They've, they've gone through that process. So what's stopping them or what what education component is there for that if Duke's not actually pushing that, saying, well, maybe you don't need to do this or maybe you need to do that, and they're just installing it? Well, I can tell you that for me and the, the conversation I had with Duke Power was I would have to speak with the homeowner because they had an order and they had to do what was in the order. So, um, anyway, so is this something that we could forward to council, full council, to uh, weigh in on and, and see if 
everyone is interested in creating an ordinance or fine tuning our ordinance um, to add these extra elements of um, lighting standards. Is, is there an interest in doing that? I don't know that I would end up supporting it, but I have no problem with the rest of council being able to, to weigh in on it. Okay. <clears throat> so Mr. Deerhog, is this something that we need um, for you to draft an ordinance for full council to look at? Defer to uh, Mr. Madden if he has uh, advice to share on what that approach should be. Uh, Ms. Kuzner, uh, members of the committee, one, one thought regarding this is to take a look at it more so as a uh, enforcement of a nuisance to identify some parameters of what could be a nuisance for lighting um, and then um, come up with some options working with the police, Chief Miller, on what could be enforced, how could it be used, and if that works, instead of uh, developing a new ordinance, amend the city's existing ordinance around nuisance. That, that's one thought of a way where we could have uh, Mr. Deerhog's department work with Chief Miller's department, discuss the issue with some sister cities on how they approach it, um, and then see if something can come around enforcement. One of the challenges with having an ordinance that really focus on lighting is, is somewhat um, limiting in, in how, you, for, for either new development or existing residents on what they have as, as lighting. Um, in the instance that we're dealing with in, in Knollwood, with the city street, with the city street light, <laughs> and they, that, that light will be moved out, right, from, from to the street where, where it belongs. Um, but for future instances, focusing more on, on at it being a nuisance, something that could be defined as a nuisance, that, that may be a thought to where you're not coming up with a new ordinance, but you're just enhancing an existing ordinance. Right, I understand that as well, but, but then I think of when homeowners start re-landscaping their, their homes and they want holes installed, they, they have to, there has to be some kind, of, just like at the fence, you can't have a fence that's taller than what 10 feet eight feet six to eight feet okay. <laughs> okay so um you know you can't have a light pole that's 20 feet tall and the broadest that it can be if it if it's going to then encroach on other people so and would the committee be okay with staff working on that as well and yes. then presenting something back to the committee Yes, yeah, so we'll just keep it in committee until y'all come back with something else. Yep. Okay. All right. That, that sounds good. I don't think we need a motion on that, right? No. Okay. That was good. We so this was more for discussion and then y'all will come back with something. Okay. All right. That Thank sounds you, good. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Deerhog. Okay. So now we come back around to our public comment. Do we have any public comment? There's no one online, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Okay, committee concerns. Hearing none, what do I hear on adjournment? So moved. Second. Second, okay. Um, any discussion? All right. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. We are adjourned at 8.07 p.m. <coughs> Next up is the Recreation Department. We'll begin the Rec Committee. It is February 7th. It is 8.08. .08. All committee members are present. And to start, we have public comment. Is there any public comment for tonight? Uh, 
No, Mr. Chair, no one's online. Thank you. That leads us to reading and approval of the minutes. What's the pleasure of the committee? Move for approval. There's a move for approval. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 It is approved. Up next, we will have reports from city officers. We have Recreation Director Bart Cumlander. Thank you, Mr. Allgood. Uh, just want to kind of give you all some updates. Uh, budgets, uh, we're, we're doing a good job in that. Um, just got the numbers from Andre. Our numbers are going up in spring sports. We got about 302 in our baseball and softball, 52 in our lacrosse, and about, um, Um, we've got about 60 in our other sports as well. So we're up uh, baseball, probably two or three teams in nine and 10, same in eight and as well. So basketball will be finishing up into this month, biggest number we ever had. Probably around 500 kids in our basketball program. The 44,000 that felt feels like when we're. It does on Saturday. You have to. Wedge your way through the gym, which is a good thing. So that's all I have. We're going in the sports center as well, and the numbers are growing uh, at the senior center. Uh, more seniors getting vaccinated, so numbers are uh, going up every day. They're doing tours every day, senior center, and so as well at the sports center. Thank you. I do have one quick question for you, and I don't know if you were here earlier. Were you here when they've given the presentation from Crawford Strategy? I was upstairs and I heard it, yes, sir. One of the things that they had said in there was that of their survey, and again, you obviously said take surveys for what it's worth, but two thirds had no, no children. I thought that was bizarre. You don't have to comment, I'm just. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I think the way she worded it was not responsible for children, which I thought was funny too. Yeah. I was like, well, in my house, I'm probably not responsible for mine either. So, <laughs> so I, I'm curious about the sampling because there's there's got to be more than that. But, but all right, thank you, Bart. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I oh, could. yes, uh, Mr. Cumberland, a quick question. Opening day when? Baseball. Yep. First week in April. Okay, thanks. Oh, and I want to mention mention too is we're all we're gonna have our egg drop again this year. We're not serving hot dogs, Taft. So. Uh, we're kind of limiting it down a little bit. We're just going to have the helicopter and drop some eggs, have some vendors that are in the area in town that want to come out as well. So we're trying to uh, downsize it a little bit as far as bounce houses and stuff because of COVID. And so we're not doing the bounce houses. We are doing the egg drop this year. So uh, all the departments going to work together and we're going to make it successful. Do you know how many dogs would chase me and follow me through the neighborhood after we cook hot dogs all day? <laughs> A good bit, I'm sure. Any other questions or comments? All right, hearing none, thank you. We have no unfinished business. We have new business, Springfield Park parking lot paving project. And Bart, are you taking that or is that going to Mr. Madden? Uh, yes, sir. So we initially, uh, when we did the budget, uh, we, we knew that we were going to be some bad, we'll have some bad soil around there. I thought on the, on the bottom end of that parking lot, we were going to have some bad soil. But they milled it down, so I would imagine that parking lot was paved in the mid-70s, uh, has a three-inch base, and at some point in time, they put another inch on it. We had some roots uh, that had busted through the asphalt and cracked. I felt like we needed to, we did the same at city. I felt like we need to mill it down so it wouldn't create, create lips uh, later on and just, and the curbing was just completely shot as well. Now that park lot, like I said, I think it was in the mid seventies, it was maybe paved initially. Um, and so they did a proof roll and it failed. Uh, not just on the bottom end, but completely, pretty much the whole whole parking lot. It looked like uh, me and 
public works director was down there with the roof roll and um, it looked like a waterbed. And so, you know, Springfield, it's kind of a bowl. Uh, it comes in from both directions. So that water's gonna sit, that water's gonna go through those cracks. And uh, before uh, we didn't have any kind of drainage, Matthew and the public works department put a drainage system in there and that, it's running that water through there pretty good now. And so we don't have that water sitting in the parking lot as we did. So um, um, answer any questions that I think I might know if you got any. So don't like coming back asking for money, but it's just, just the age of the parking lot. Further questions? Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this may be easier directed at Mr. Fleeman while I was giving the eye there. Are we at the point where this is obvious, obviously a substantial increase? Are we at the point that we look at a different surface, for instance, concrete? Is that coming into play where you couldn't take and it's less prep work, it's less... To concrete the entire parking lot, um, while you certainly could explore that option, concrete, as you know, is actually some of the highest prices it's been in a while. Um, and you still have to have a stable sub base to pour the concrete on top of. Um, you know, Bart referenced a, a proof roll. It's uh, what we do in the, in the process of doing it is we, we take out a dump truck loaded with 40,000 pounds of, of weight. So a total weight of you know, an excess of 60,000 pounds and we roll over that sub base. And you know, if it's compacted enough, which is the standard we use for putting down roadways and parking lots, um, those tires should just go right over the surface of it. Um, there was literally only one small tiny section maybe between you and I that actually passed at Springfield. Everything else, like I, I like, love that reference, moved like a waterbed. Um, if, if we were to explore other materials out there, they, in all cases, they would necessitate the removal of the, of the, of the soils present. Um, and and I, I don't necessarily believe that that's the best course of action. Mind you that we have a, a large area of unpaved area, you know, unpaved dirt exposed in the wet season um, that has cause, can cause a, a, a potential. Can really mess up the park, especially before opening day. Okay, can Panagakis start and finish this com this quickly? Yes, or so we, and the reason we waited now because it's just a window we had to get in there. Uh, I had somebody come up to me and say, well, why are y'all tearing up the parking lot now and baseball's right around the season? So, you know, we'll start our football season in the end of July, August, the spring ball, so we needed the part then and then it ended in November. So we got on their docket. So now what the problem is now is we got it being wet. And so I'm, as soon as y'all, it's okay. Yes, I think we'll be about a week out. It's going to be, we'll be going into March because we're about to bring it up to full council as well. So mm -hmm. that's the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm on it. I'm, because we're going to be uh, jammed uh, at sunset to try and get all the practices in spring sports. So within the daily field report that BLE provided, there were, there were three options, correct? Correct. The third option where they mix the concrete in, actually Pat Atkins does not do that. They would have to get a third party to come in and do that. Okay. He was going to give us price prices on that. He has not yet. Uh, I can try to have that price for you before we get in full council in July. I think given the the size of the issue here, then yeah, I'd say you would, we need to make sure we've got all the options there and, and let council decide. We'll do. Any other questions? I have two questions. The first is in the, uh, it says 2022, that should be 21. On October 18, 2021 meeting, 
it said that we up the budget to 225,000. Was that just a general estimate that we had or did they give that to us? That, that was the proposal from Patagakis, the contractor, 225,000. Right, so I what was initially proposed, I think we, we went off of what we were thinking was gonna be 175 yeah. or something. To that it was point. significately less like than 225. A larger area. <laughs> And that's the curving as well. All, that's basically, 95% right. of that curving is gone. Uh, we, we were able to save some when we did the city, city park project. Uh, it wasn't busted up as bad, but pretty much all the curving at Springfield is just shot. Gotcha. And this might be a question for Matthew. Uh, when we look at the contract, it says on item number five, Unless there is at least a 1% fall on the area to be paved, we do not guarantee the water will drain from pavement. Can you explain that one to me as a layman? Sure, um, rise over run. Uh, they wanna ensure that you have a straight pitch from the parking lot to whatever the ultimate uh, catchment of the stormwater will be. In this case, we have a, a bottom corner, we have two drains, we have a stormwater catch basin with wing walls and a pipe, um, but diverted two separate ways. Uh, rise over on one percent is you're just over one foot over a hundred feet. Yeah. So overall, you think this is pretty standard? Yes. That's, yes. That was proposed and everything, and will help with. Cause it seems like there was some stormwater issues mentioned earlier on with the property or with that parking lot. This would alleviate that. You think? It's yes. Kind of and then, is there any kind of warranty on the work? Yes, uh, Panagakis provides warranty. Is that not in the contract? It's, it's there's one, it's one year. Is that standard? Uh, typically, uh, it's, you know, you, you, you won't find play the contractors that will go that far out past a year on the work. You may have some that might, um, but that's not typical. Typ typically, it's one year. The last one we had was for 30 years, but of course I know you're fixing it routinely for 30 years too, right? Well, the 40, 40, <laughs> 40 years. Oh, the uh, the existing. Yes. What was that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Any other questions? I think just more of a comment than anything. Certainly, this is one of those situations where something has not been done in a long, long time, and when you renovate anything, there are surprises. So nature of the beast. Thank you, Mr. Fleeman, for staying around and allowing for some extra questions. All right, what's the pleasure of the committee? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, since this has not been done in forever and it needs to be done correctly, um, I'm all about that base. So let's go ahead and forward this to full council nope. uh, <laughs> with a recommendation for approval. I I'm not supporting this. <laughs> I have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second that. There is a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. This brings us to our second part for public comment. Are there any folks that want to comment? There's no one online, Mr. Chair. Are there any committee concerns? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. It is approved. We are concluded at 822. Okay, everyone here and present. I'm gonna go ahead and call the Finance and Policy Committee meeting to order. The date is February 7th, 2022. The time is now 823. This is the final meeting of the evening. Members present are myself, Michael Reynolds, Ms. Carol King, and Ms. Diane Kuznar, as well as audience, our city administrator, finance director, Ms. Holly Abercrombie, as well as HR director, Mr. Mark Putnam. Uh, first item we have is public comment. Is there anyone online or present who would like to speak to this committee? There's no one online, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Madden, no one here either. Moving on, reading and approval of minutes. These are from Finance Committee meeting dated January 4th, 2022. What do I hear on those? Motion to approve as submitted. I have a motion to approve as submitted. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion to approve as and a second. Any more discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries unanimously. Next item is going to be administrator's uh, budget review. Mr. Madden. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. The city's uh, administration budget is right in line where it should be for this time of year. Uh, this, as far as the fiscal year 2023 budget, um, the department directors, uh, the budgets will be due to the finance office at the end of the week. And staff is, looks forward to putting together a recommended budget for the council to consider. Do you look forward to it? Because it's going to be a challenging year. <laughs> it's going to be a great year. I agree. Um, okay, any questions for Mr. Madden? Very good. Hearing none. Ms. Abercrombie, your budget review, please. I think while she's coming up here, the committee should go ahead and apologize to Ms. Miller for whatever we've done to be last the last two, two times we met. I think we were last last time. Good evening, Chair and committee. Um, as you've heard from everybody, the budgets look pretty much in line with where they're supposed to be. Um, there's been no, um, besides some of the, um, one of the things you heard tonight, there's nothing, you know, major out there besides the soil and that parking lot done. But other than that, there's nothing else. If there's any particular questions, I'd be glad to answer them. And Brandon stole my thunder on the current, I mean, the fiscal year 23 budget that we're, we're working on. Three hours you sat here waiting to say that one thing and he jumps in. Thank you, Ms. Abercrombie. Do we have any questions for Ms. Abercrombie? Hearing none, okay. Glad you're feeling better. <laughs> uh, Mr. Putnam, our Human Resources Director. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. Uh, just wanted to report this time that uh, Really one of the things we've been working on over the last couple of weeks, and it will take us about two more weeks as we've been working through a audit with PIBA and uh, on our retirement uh, issues with them on uh, making some corrections that they are suggesting we make. We are working through those as we speak and should be done with that uh, within the next two weeks. And you'll provide a report for those at our next committee? Yes. Any questions for Mr. Putnam? waiting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Putnam. Okay, next item is unfinished business. We have none this evening. Uh, the next item is going to be new business. We have an amendment to the employee handbook. Mr. Putnam, if you'll come up and give us some background on where this is coming from. All right. Um, in 2020, uh, council approved a new employee handbook. And part of that, we changed uh, on our holiday uh, pay, um, if you'll look at uh, your attachment, um, it, it, the current policy states when a holiday falls on an employee's regular day off, the employee had, uh, shall receive another day off in lieu of the holiday. Days off in lieu of holidays must be taken by the next pay period, which means if I have one this week, within 14 days, I have to take it. For most, for almost all of the city, that is not a problem. Where it is a problem is with the police force. Uh, a couple of things uh, have uh, exemplified or made that uh, even greater, COVID. And of course, our shortage of um, manpower, especially in our dispatch. So you've got to understand that each shift uh, in the police department has eight officers and two dispatchers. So when a holiday falls and somebody and that group that the shifts are off, that means 16 officers and four um, dispatchers must be scheduled an additional day off within a 14 day period. period. And you can imagine that is a scheduling nightmare right now. Uh, and it has caused times where employees were really close to not getting to take their holiday. So what we are proposing is the wording that you see in front of you that says, with the exception of the Malden Police Department, everything will be the same. And then it says for the Malden Police Department personnel, when a holiday falls on a, um, falls on a Malden Police Department employee's regular day off, the employee shall uh, receive holiday pay in the pay period for which the holiday occurs. So what that means is if I'm off, I just get paid during that time. It will not cost the city anything else. 
If anything, it will save the city money uh, because of having to schedule overtime for somebody to cover that, that uh, holiday um, and such. And just for clarification, dispatchers fall under Malden Police Department personnel also? Yeah, yes, they Thank would. You. Yes. Okay. okay. What do I hear on this item? Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. King. Um, just because of the history I have with this personnel policy and the revision and um, being chair of public safety and not knowing that this was coming out until I got it in my packet over the weekend, I would like for committee to perhaps consider other options rather than, I, I don't see any urgency in having to make a decision tonight, I guess is my point. Um, so I would like for us to kind of talk through it a little bit and see if there were maybe another option um, versus um, paying, and again, kind of like a committee earlier tonight, we may circle back around and have the same conclusion, but I would like some time to discuss it. Um, the reason that the change was made um, originally, it was basically because it was a problem tracking um, those holidays when they were floating holidays. So that's why the time restraint was put in there to assist Mr. Putman and, and the, um, the department heads at that time with the burden, so to speak, to, to track um, those floating holidays over an entire year sometimes. Yeah. So um, that's why the limitation was put in there. I'm not so sure that, you know, maybe we could extend the time period from a pay period to 30 days or 60 days. Um, the employee is going to get paid regardless. That's not the issue. I think it's just, um, but, but again, I don't want to put that extra burden of tracking. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, I just need a little bit of time to digest it and see if there's any other options out there um, rather than what's been presented to us tonight. And, sure. and please keep in mind that the hardest time to get it in scheduling where we would need to, if we were gonna look at extending the period uh, is for the Thanksgiving through the January 1 time period because you have, you have holidays. so many holidays that fall into a fairly short period of time and we'd have to, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm thinking options are good and we should take a look at it, is that we, we really have to look at that time, that, that, that time period. Okay, so thank you. Yes, Ms. Kuznar. Thank you. Um, I think that when this was redone, then in 2021, they had the opportunity to see what was going to happen and then ran into this issue. And that's why we are here today. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we do also have Easter coming up. And so is this something that we need to go ahead and look at um, rather than keep putting it off well uh, I believe if I'm not if I if I'm correct I believe Easter is in April this year am I correct it is good okay. Friday I think so we do have a uh, March time frame if you would like to look at it we could uh, talk uh, through some scenarios bring it up again in March and then council could vote on it in March and then we could move forward because that's that's when your next holiday is right okay great so if it pleases council we'll hold this in committee we'll hold this in committee till next committee meeting and i get a chance to talk about it further and then maybe what we can do is uh chief miller and i can get together and work with y'all uh, on that you took the next words i was going to say thank you mr putnam yes sir all right there will be no action on that item this evening so then our next item up is Public comment, having none and none being online. Committee concerns for finance and policy. Hearing none from the committee, what do I hear on adjournment? So moved. I have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned without discussion.